Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about two sample inference procedures with means. We just finished doing the ones with pr proportions, so now we're going to talk about the ones with means. So, for two sample proportions procedures with means, the goal of these procedures is always to compare the responses to two treatments, or maybe we're comparing the characteristics of two different populations. So if we have two experiments and we're comparing the responses, we would talk about treatments. If we're doing a survey of some sort and we're comparing the characteristics of populations, uh, then we we'll refer to it in that case. Either way, we must have independent samples from each treatment or population that is imperative. Now, remember way back a long time ago in the depths of your memory, hopefully you remember that when we're subtracting two groups, two means, and we want to calculate a brand new mean, the mean of x minus y, we can simply subtract the mean of x minus the mean of y. Means are easy. They behave exactly the way you would expect them to. Standard deviations, however, do not. If we are trying to subtract two standard deviations, we can't just subtract them. It doesn't work that way. Instead, we have to square the x one and square the y one and add them together and then take the square root. Hopefully, these two formulas are jogging some brain cells there for you. We will give me it. We mostly, when we're doing two sample procedures, we're going to be interested in the difference of means. So we're going to use this little fact here that's on the screen to help us find the standard error. Now, talk, just think about this question for a minute. Suppose we have a population of adult men. Men have a mean height of 71 inches and a standard deviation of 2.6. We also have a population of adult women. Adult women have a mean height of 65 and a standard deviation of 2.3. And we know from past experience that heights are normally distributed. Describe the distribution of the differences in heights between males and females. And we're going to do male minus female. This is a describe a distribution problem. So you're going to want to cuss. You're going to want to talk about the center. You're going to want to talk about the shape. And you're going to want to talk about the spread of the distribution of a difference. So in order to do that, you would first think, well, men's heights are normally distributed. Women's heights are normally distributed. Therefore, men minus women are going to be normally distributed. So the shape is normal distribution. The center would be the mean. Means behave the way we, we would expect. If we're subtracting, we just subtract. 71 minus 65, boom, there you go. Standard deviations, that's your spread. They don't behave the way we would expect. We can't just subtract them. Instead, we have to square them, add them together, and take the square root. So if we square 2.6, square 2.3, add them together, take the square root, that's going to be the mean of the difference between males and females. So this type of problem, hopefully this does ring a bell because we did this. I know it was a long time ago, but hopefully it is uh, jogging some brain cells back there for you. And here's our description. Here's a nice little picture to show there's males, there's females. And if we subtract them, we wind up getting a curve that looks like that. Now on your notes packet, there's four more parts, A, B, C, D, and A, B, C, and D. And I want you to do parts A, B, C, and D as part of your homework for tonight. See if you can answer those, and we'll talk about them when you come to class tomorrow. All right, so moving on to our inference procedures. Our good old friend, the assumptions. We can use these inference procedures, either confidence intervals or hypothesis tests, when we have two simple random samples from the populations or two randomly assigned treatment groups, either one. Now, I know a lot of people get locked in on the SRSs, and on the test, they always write SRS for everything, even when it's not an SRS. If it's an experiment, then it's not an SRS. It's two randomly assigned treatment groups. So you have to distinguish between an experiment with treatments versus a simple random sample. Samples will be independent. They must be independent. Both distributions are approximately normal. That's key. They both must be approximately normal. In order to determine that, we use the CLT. Either they have large sample sizes, or if the sample sizes aren't large, we have to graph both sets of data and see what they look like. And finally, sigmas are known or unknown. 99.9% .9 of the time, the sigmas will be unknown, in which case we're going to have to use the T procedures. Every once in a while, maybe they'll try and throw a trick at you, and the sigmas will be known, and then we can use a z-score, a z-procedure instead. 
Degrees of freedom, since we are going to have to use the T procedures most of the time, there are two options for degrees of freedom. Option one, we can use the smaller of the two values, N1, the first sample, minus one, and the second sample, minus two. So if you have 30 subjects in the first one and 27 in the second one, we would use the smaller of the two in order to establish our degrees of freedom because we want to be more conservative than maybe we really need to. This will produce conservative values. Option two, and this is probably the best way to go, to use an approximation by getting that you get off your tech, off technology, off your calculator. And get ready for this. Here's the formula for that. Now don't write that down. You do not need to know how to calculate the degree of freedom for a two sample test. The calculator will do all of that mess for you and we'll show you how to do that in class. So don't bother, don't write it down, don't really need to know it. All right, calculator does it automatically for you. So for a confidence interval, we'll do this first. Here's our good old friend, the confidence inter interval formula. It hasn't changed. You take your statistic, plus or minus your critical value, times the standard deviation of the statistic. The statistic for a two sample is x bar one minus x bar two. You take the two means, you subtract them. That's your statistic. The critical value is still the t star value. That hasn't changed. And the standard deviation of the statistic is given by this formula. So you take the standard deviation of sample one squared divided by the number in sample one plus standard deviation of sample two squared divided by the number in sample two and take square root of all that. All right? That is called the standard error. That part right there is called the standard error. And if you put it together with your T star critical value, that's called the margin of error. Now, for a hypothesis test, again, it's the same basic formula. You take your statistic, you subtract your parameter, and you divide it by the standard deviation of the statistic. We've been seeing this over and over and over and over and over again, so hopefully this is getting familiar. The test statistic will be the t value. You do your statistic, which is x bar 1 minus x bar 2, minus your parameter, which would be mu 1 minus mu 2, divided by the standard deviation of the statistic, which we just wrote down a minute ago, and so now you just have to rewrite it again. Now, go back a second. Normally, that mu 1 minus mu 2, normally when we're doing a test statistic, we are testing to see whether the difference is, whether there is no difference. So nine times out of 10, that mu one minus mu two part is just gonna be zero. But we'll talk more about that in a minute. Now, when you do this on your calculator, you get an interesting little query. And it'll ask you whether you wanna use pooled procedures. We use, statisticians use pooled procedures when you have two populations that have the same variance. If two populations have the exact same variance, then you can use something called a pooled procedure. When you pool, you take the you average the two sample variances to estimate the common population variance. Don't use this on the AP exam. We do not know the variances of the population. Almost never will we know the variances of the population. So, rule of thumb, always tell the calculator no for pooling. If you're really curious about the nitty-gritty details of all these statistical procedures we're doing, when you get to college, after you've gotten a five on the AP exam and you've tested out a first year statistics, sign up for statistics too and you can learn all about pooling. All right, so here's an example question. We have two competing headache remedies that claim to give fast acting relief. They perform, someone performs an experiment to compare the mean lengths of time required for bodily absorption of brand A versus brand B. We're going to assume the absorption time is normally distributed. 12 people are randomly selected and given an oral dosage of brand A, another 12 were selected and given an equal dosage of brand B. They recorded the mean time for brand A, the standard deviation, and the same thing for brand B. And they're asking us to do a 95% confidence interval different for the difference in mean lengths of time required for the bodily absorption. All right, so we're being asked to do a 95% confidence interval. That's a panic problem, if you remember. So first off, we're gonna state our assumptions. Assumptions first, we must have two independent randomly assigned treatments. So see how they kind of combine two assumptions there at the same time? And secondly, we are given that the absorption rate is normally distributed. 
was nice of them to tell us that, so we didn't have to worry about it. And finally, the sigmas, we don't know. They're unknown, which means we're going to need t procedures. Okay, so we'll do the formula and we do the calculations. There's our good old friend, the formula that we just wrote down a minute ago. Our degree of freedom is going to be 11 because both sample sizes were both 12. 12 minus 1 is 11. We take the smaller, which would be 11. So we're going to use that. So we subtract x bar 1 minus x bar 2. Take the t star value that we got from our calculator or from the back of the book, either one. Plug in the 8.7 and the 7.5. Do a little plus minus in calculator work. And there's our interval. And finally, of course, the reason we're using a T star for a degree of freedom of 11 and 95% confidence interval, I always want to think price is right closest without going over. You never want to go over your degree of freedom. You can't go too high. It's always better to go underneath. And then do your conclusions. We are 95% confident that the true difference in mean, that is in red because it is important, very important, write it down. The true difference in mean lengths of time required for the bodily absorption of each brand is between a negative 6.098 minutes and 8.498 minutes. Ideally, in there somewhere, you'd want to talk about which one you subtracted, A minus B or B minus A. You want to clue in whoever's grading you. You want to make sure that you made that very clear as to which one you were talking about there. Now, take a note on confidence interval statements. Back in the last chapter, we did matched pairs, and you were referring to a t-test for the mean difference. This time, in two samples, we're talking about the difference of means. In years past, these two things have caused quite a bit of confusion, and people always get them mixed up. Remember what we did in matched pairs, right? We took, we subtracted each one first, and made a brand new list that was our difference list and then we took the mean of the list. In this case we're doing the mean of sample 1 and the mean of sample 2 and we're subtracting those two means. So that's where the phrasing comes from. You have to be very very careful about the writing there because if you say mean difference but you're doing a two sample the judge is going to think to themselves this person doesn't have a clue what they're doing and so you don't want to make you want to make sure you don't do that. All right, your turn. Here's a question. It is in your packet. I want you to do this for homework. Do it exactly the same way as I did the previous one. You don't need to write this down. It's in your packet. So I'm going to move on to our last little thing. Hypothesis statements. When you're doing a two sample hypothesis statement, you can either do mu1 minus mu2 equals zero, or you could simply do mu1 equals mu2. Works both ways. You could do mu1 is less than mu2. Or you can do mu1 minus mu2 is greater than 0, which translates into mu1 is greater than mu2. The alternate will almost always be mu1 equals mu2. I'm sorry, the null will almost always be mu1 equals mu2. The alternate then would be mu1 is less than mu2, mu1 is greater than mu2, or potentially mu1 is not equal to mu2. So three different versions of the alternate statement in that case. Be sure off to the side that you define both of them. Tell me what is mu1 and what is mu2 in words. You have to do that. We talked about this test, test statistic. You already wrote this down earlier, so you don't need to write it down again because it's the exact same thing. And as I mentioned earlier, usually mu1 minus mu2, we usually assume the null is true. If mu1 equals mu2, that was our null. Remember, mu1 equals mu2. If these are true, then mu1 minus mu2 is going to be 0. So usually we just leave this part out, cross that out. Don't usually need it. And occasionally you do, but most of the time you don't. Here's our sample question. Same exact question we just did a minute ago about the blood, the drug level in blood. This time we want to know, is there sufficient evidence that these drugs differ in the speed? Is there evidence that they are not the same? First, state our assumptions. We did them a minute ago, they're the same too. We have two independent randomly assigned treatments given the absorption rate is normally distributed, and we don't know sigma. Hypothesis. Mu A, brand A, the mean of brand A, equals the mean of brand B, where, and I defined it off to the side there. Notice how I defined that? Very important. The alternate is that they're not equal. Formula and calculations. Test statistic. We just wrote it down, remember? 
So we plug in 20.1, we plug in 18.9, we plug in S1, we plug in S2, we plug in the ends, do a little bit of calculator magic, and we wind up getting our T value is 0.361. Your calculator will calculate the P value, the degree of freedom, the T value, wonderful things, these calculators. They will calculate all of this for you, but I like the idea of writing the formula down just to show that grader that, hey, I'm not a calculator junkie. I know how to do all this and then write your conclusion in context. Since the p-value is greater than alpha, I fail to reject the null, there is not sufficient evidence to suggest that these drugs differ in the speed at which they enter the bloodstream. You can find this in your test menu in your calculator. So stat, go over to test, and then guess what you're looking for? Two sample t-test. And then you can put in all these numbers and there's your p-value, there's your degree of freedom, there's your t-statistic, everything you possibly need to know to answer the question. Okay, you're going to do this one on your own. Try the best you can. And then when you come into class tomorrow, I'll ask for volunteers to put it up on the board and we can see how you did.